Hello everyone, my name is Stacy Parson and I'm a partner with the Dignitas Agency. And uh, one of the things that we do is work with leaders every day to um, build more inclusive organizations. And the way that we do that is by helping them identify limiting beliefs and transform those into breakthrough beliefs. And also by navigating some of the friction that arises as you try to navigate large scale change. And so um, today I'm here with Hans-Peter Bronmo and we're going to be talking about navigating uncertainty. Um, HP, as I, as I probably call him most often, is um, a vice president at X, the Moonshot Factory, and you all may uh, recognize that organization as formerly Google X, and he is the general manager of the Everyday Robots Project. He and I know each other um, from our work over the last several years around leadership development in general and really being able to unlock his team um, as quickly and as fast as possible around um, trying to create things that have never been created before in the world. And so um, inside of that work, we have been getting familiar and really practicing a model called Next Level Results. And there's a couple of things that are interesting about that model, but one of them in particular is how do you notice um, when you hesitate? How do you notice when you stop moving forward towards the very thing that you want to be achieving? And how do you um, unwind from that as quickly as possible. So we've been in the practice of this together for about two years. And um, one of the reasons why I am delighted to be in this conversation with him is because um, it is um, really interesting to watch how HPU in particular um, always show up to a challenging situation with curiosity and leaning in and trying to figure out, okay, so what do we do next as opposed to stopping? And so um, I think you're a particularly interesting person to be talking about um, social equity, systemic equity, and how to create more inclusive organizations. So welcome and thanks for being in this conversation with me. It's great to be here. Look forward to this. All right. So I, I just want to jump right in. Um, you know, we're, as I mentioned, you and I have, almost all of our conversations are about navigating uncertainty and how to show up as the leader that we really want to be um, in, especially those uncertain moments where the pressure is high and um, you either do it or you don't. There's like, there's no in between kind of. And um, I'm just curious if, you know, how you're thinking about the particular uncertainties that we're dealing with right now with the pandemic, with um uh, social unrest right now with, um, you know, we're getting ready to, in our political climate, perhaps um, have a shift in leadership, um, perhaps have continued leadership, but there's a lot of uncertainty around that process. And that is all on top of the general uncertainty around trying to do something that has never been done before in the world. So how, how are you thinking about leadership right now? Well, you know, as, as we've talked about quite a bit, Stacy, you know, leadership exist at kind of different levels. Uh, but I think that maybe the, the two most important aspects and responsibilities of, of any leadership and any leader right now is to focus you know, on the short term, focus on tomorrow, focus on today. You know, people care about the fact that they're gonna have a job tomorrow. They care about what the immediate situation is today. But then also to tell a story about the future. Mm. You know, to, to let people know where we're headed. And in uncertain times, you know, those things probably get amplified, right? Because you want to know that your loved ones, your coworkers will be okay, and they want to know they want to be okay. You want to make sure that the tomorrow is 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 in focus, but you also want to see a path to the future. You want to see a path forward because um, if if we if we can't overcome our short term fears that you know by dreaming big, um, then then you know why why are we here in a sense, right? And so, so I focus also a little bit on, you know, on, on this notion, I want to bring in this notion of, of servant leadership and what it means to sort of stand up for what we believe in around the fine of principles and values that we have and we hold dear. And so, you know, taking responsibility as a leader is, is, is therefore, I think it's very important to hold those principles and values very central and make sure that you know the, the the people, the organizations you're leading, are are, are bought into them and, and share those principles and values. Mm. 
So, you know, one of the things I want to pull in here uh, as, as I'm listening to you talk is uh, the model, the Kinefin model that we've talked about before. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's uh, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. And one of the things it talks about is how to navigate complex problems. And as you're talking, I can imagine that some people, when they hear you say, you know, uh, it's important for a leader to kind of paint that, that vision of tomorrow. Um, I think for some people, they feel like they have to have it all figured out before they can do that. And one of the things that we've been, uh, you know, practicing and, and observing is that with complex problems, you don't know always, and you have to kind of sense your way into this. And one of the things that um, in the work that we do, we notice a lot is that leaders are really not sure how to bridge this, you know, this, this intersection of what they think about personally and, you know, what their role is as a leader, particularly around social justice issues or, or trying to create more equity in organizations. They're just really uncertain about how to take that stand that you talk about. And I'm just wondering, you know, how would you, how would you want people to think about that? So, well, a couple of thoughts. First off, and I guess a bit of a pet peeve of mine, right, is th there's no leadership in guiding people on a safe path. Right, right. If we're on a path we all know, then it's just really sort of, you know, everybody walking together down the path. Yeah. So leadership is about charting new paths, right, um, with others to places that maybe nobody's gone before or places that we don't even know exist yet. And, and then you can say, okay, so where are all the dimensions of that? Well, there's the, there's the technology dimension. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, taking big risks in technology. There's the business dimension. We, we try to develop new business models and take risk in, risk in business. But there's also the sort of like the broader impact dimension, right? What's the impact of our work on society at large? And, you know, and, and so, you know, while it's easy to focus on taking risk and the crazy and cool technology, you know, I'm also very committed to experimenting with and asking the sort of difficult, difficult questions about the broader social uh, and societal impact um, and, you know, sort of what success looks like in the broadest sense of the world. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, and, and on top of that, of course, there's sort of your 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 personal journey and your personal path, right? And so so while there's all that stuff happening, you know, in times like what we live with live in, in now, there's also this overlay of our our personal journey. Um, our our you know we wake up in the morning and we hear some news and it might be frightening or it might be disconcerting. So you know both as leaders and as as participants in a in a in a company and a culture, you you have to navigate all of these and holding all of them and, and recognizing and making room, room for all of them at the, at the same time. So I, I want to go back to the first thing that you said um, about the safe path. One of the things we're often doing is just reminding leaders that there's a difference between leader and manager. And if, and if it's already been figured out and it's just about executing, then you're managing. And if you're someone like a CEO doing that, then you're just a really highly paid manager as opposed to someone who's actually leading. And that surprisingly is something that people have forgotten or they don't really have a somatic feeling of like what it is to have to make choices without all the information and to sit in that space all the time. Um, so so that, that's, that's one thing. But I, the other thing that I hear you saying is, I mean, I, I was thinking, listening to the sequence, you were saying like, okay, there's this, this responsibility I have in the seat and then there's my personal journey. And I think sometimes leaders think about it the other way, like what's my personal journey and do, and should I be bringing that to my work? And in the way that I hear you saying it is you've already reconciled that part of my work is to have a positive impact in the world. And you're, and you're reconciling that first in your seat. Yeah. You know, in, a, in one way I want to, I want to acknowledge like upfront that, you know, I, I'm. I feel like incredibly, incredibly privileged right now, right? Because I'm in this organization that where you know we have the privilege and the opportunity to lean into these questions because the existential risk is not there. I mean, I recognize for so many people right now, there's sort of existential concerns, right? I, am I going to have a job tomorrow? Is my company going to be around tomorrow? Is my startup going to be able to happen in this funding climate? Right. I mean, there's so many of these sort of existential risks, but I, I think what what 
what I think is particularly interesting is given that opportunity, and we all have it, we can all create it, even if there is, even if we are dealing with, you know, more or less uncertainty, that opportunity to bring your whole self to work, to, to come to work as people, not as suits, mm-hmm. right? And, and to show up in a way where, you know, we look at each other as people, we're curious about, you know, what that other person is about. And that curiosity, by the way, you know, it obviously goes both ways. When you create a lot of curiosity, I think you create a very vibrant culture. People are leaning in and they're asking why. They're asking, you know, they're, they're bringing, when they can bring their whole selves to work, it just creates an entirely different type of work dynamic and creative and innovation culture than if they're sort of holding back and just showing up with their power suits on. Right, right. And I, you know, one of the things that we do at the Dignitas Agency is we always, uh, we, we, one of our taglines is real talk. And, you know, as you're talking, um, uh, one of the things we always like to, to clarify is that um, with regard to more equitable and inclusive organizations, there's kind of two parts to it, right? There's the, how do we allow people to bring their best selves so that they bring all of um, their capabilities and, and their experience to bear in, in the moments when the organization needs it? Um, and that's kind of the inclusion side, the belonging side. And then, it, you know, to, to where you started around ri- the risk, you're talking about existential risk. Um, the other side of it is that for a lot of the population, they're, they're not existential risks. There's actually real risk out there that has us paying attention to social justice issues and equity issues in the first place. And so I think, you know, when we, when we talk about that risk, um, what we realize is that um, for some, some leaders, that risk to even have that conversation and to even raise that topic and to bring it um, to the forefront is, is too high for them. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, what are some of the risks that you experience or feel um, as you are moving towards more equity and inclusion in your team? Yeah, that's that's a sort of central question, isn't it, Stacey? I mean, I look, I I wonder sometimes if the question of am I taking a risk by bringing equity and inclusion, you know, into my work and into my conversations and and into the dialogue, public or private, is that the right question at all? Is like, what's the risk of not doing that? What's the risk of not choosing to create more inclusive organizations? Mm-hmm. So, so you know, we're framing so much of this in terms of downside risk, right? It's 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 if I do this, you know, I don't know. There's it's risky. It's uncertain. You know, maybe I'll get get egg on my face. But you know, there's also this thing: no risk, no reward, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, if we if we're in an environment that is changing as fast as the environments we're in, we're always taking risk. We're always leaning into, like, you know, the, the, the world is, is changing super fast around us. So there's always risk. So, you know, the fear that sort of our choices and our voices um, kind of, you know, not having, not making choices, the difficult choices, and not having a voice actually sort of stops us. I think it, it, it can be paralyzing, right? And it paralyzes way too many people from making the changes and leaning into the discomfort and the uncertainty that will ultimately help us get through this. So, you know, technology is changing, business models are changing, our customers are changing, culture is changing. So we got to change too, right? And, and if we sit back and wait until we have all the answers and then we change, well, guess what? The bus, you know, the train will have left that station, right? And and not only that, but we'll, not only will we be way behind, but we will understand the world as it emerges. So a big part of, you know, w- one of the things, you know, I, I do in my day job, right, is I work on really difficult, large technical sort of moonshots and, and problems. And we're trying to do things that we ultimately know will have a huge impact, you know, when it comes to fruition. And we're working really hard on making that impact positive and understanding what will make it positive and what won't. And so questions like this, questions like equity and inclusion, broadly speaking, are critical to, you know, to our, to our future success. And, you know, because it helps us understand what the markets will look like, what our customers will look like. Um, and it helps us bring the best talent and the most interesting voices to the table as we deal with problems that, you know, nobody's ever dealt with before. Right, right. You know, the, um, the risk question is really interesting, too, because, you know, as humans, we always uh, calibrate the downside risk much more 
um, yeah. closely and keenly than the, the upside risk. So it's, you know, we have to kind of unlearn that about the way our brains work or kind of counteract that in some ways. Um, one of the things that we've been talking to leaders about is, you know, I love that you went, went to like, what, what's the risk of not doing this? Because I think in the, you know, in the days following George Floyd's killing right around May 25th, a lot of leaders were coming to us um, saying, you know, what is actually happening? What's happening in the environment right now? And how do we interpret it? And how do, how do I actually show up as a leader here? And I think any time a leader is in that place, like where they're blindsided from that way, there's a risk that they haven't calculated. There's a risk that was on the horizon somewhere that they missed. And, and one of the things that's super important about, you know, about this, this type of um, dynamic is that no one person can scan for all the risks, right? And I think that's one of the, one of the promises of, of having a diverse team of leaders who can actually bring their experience and their intersections to bear so that the team can assess the risk more broadly. But you know what, just in, in terms of the tech world, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me around risk is just how um, you know, artificial intelligence and um, facial recognition, for instance, as, an, as, a, as a technology is now um, in the hot seat, so to speak, because there were some things that I think people weren't really factoring completely in to how it worked and who it was impacting and how it was impacting people. And so, you know, even if, you know, when, if people have a little bit of hesitation around talking about what they feel is politics, I think what they're completely missing is policy and how outcomes are affected by policy and practice. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, if, if you were talking to someone as you're talking to people who are starting out and thinking about, you know, what they're creating and, and how to um, avoid some of the pitfalls of that blind, those blind spots, what would you, what would you have them think about? You know, I, I think the, I think the thing that comes to mind to me is that we all have kind of these internal alarm bells Right, and there are these little feelings that go off that generate some sensation, right? And so, oftentimes, that sensation is very strong when it's discomfort, when mm -hmm. it's fear, mm -hmm. right? And we're also probably all pretty good at like, "Ooh, that doesn't feel good," so I'm going to push that away. I'm going to push away the discomfort. I'm going to push away the fear, and it's going to move to the comfortable space, the space I'm familiar with. And so, whether that's you know running a small startup or running as a leader, part of what I see kind of the opportunity being is actually not shutting that down mm. and saying, I, you know, this conversation makes me really uncomfortable. I, but like, why, why am I feeling uncomfortable in this conversation? And there's a ton of information in that, you know, that's signal value, right? So there's a ton of information in that discomfort. And so when you start seeing these sort of feeling these little moments of like, ah, that conversation ain't kind of working for me. Let's just, to make you know, let's talk about something else, y'all. Let's go have a beer. You know, that's the that's the wrong response, in my opinion, because it means that we're we're just sort of repressing and pushing away something that has signal value, and with that signal comes learning, right? Because it's leaning into that discomfort, it is understanding it deeper, it is being vulnerable enough with the people around you and your teams that you're willing to share it and say, like you know, when some of these, you know, when you know. Let's just look at the last year, right? Or a couple of years. It's been Me Too. It's been BLM. It's been COVID-19. And then, of course, you know, tragedy of George Floyd. There have been all these moments, which then, of course, turn into a lot more than moments. Now, when these things happen, again, you know, you go, oh, that's horrible. And you feel some discomfort. You feel some concern. Like, you know, as a, as a white guy, when Me Too happened, it's like, I can't really say anything here because whatever I say will be misunderstood. Well, that's kind of a cop out, right? So what, what you know, what can a, per, you know, a, a guy like me, a man like me contribute in terms of leaning into that and, and make mistakes? I'm going to, in participating in that conversation, I'm not going to have the lived experience and the suffering that many of the people who showed up in Me Too or around all these other issues have had. And so, so, so my challenge then is to be humble, to be, you know, to, to lead with compassion 
and lead with sort of, you know, with compassion comes a deeper understanding and learning, right? With judgment, you know, basically comes building walls and sort of blocking stuff off, right? So it's leaning into that compassion. And don't get me wrong, it's scary, right? It's scary every time. And my words can often be misconstrued. Uh, you know, lots of people are out to sort of make you make you bad for one reason or another. But if we allow for that, then we let cancel culture win. And we let these, you know, these sort of parts of, of what's going on right now, uh, you know, kind of triumph. So, so my view is, you know, in those situations, I obviously like to listen a lot more than talk. And even, you know, as you know, even coming here and talking to you today, it's like, you know, should I just listen to a conversation you're having or should I actually show up and talk to you on this? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, if I'm going to walk the talk, then let's have this conversation a little more publicly, right? And, and lean into it. So there's like five things that I, I want to circle back to. And I'm smiling because you're, you're going to give me a chance to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the next level results stuff. But um, as you were talking about that, that signal and when it, when it comes up, a lot, of, a lot of the times when we're working with leaders around equity work, what we, what we know is that if you're going to change a system to be more equitable, you're going to have to relearn things. You're going to have to stretch. You're going to have to ultimately do things differently um, than they've always been. And what that means, you're going to have to engage with the system. So there is literally a somatic and visceral response that um, comes up. And um, when that comes up, it's those moments that you're talking about. Like, what do you do in that moment? And, you know, the model would say, you know, you either have a chance to go above the line and continue to move towards what you care about or go below the line and stop. And what you're talking about is the above the line, what, you know, what it looks like when you say, regardless of the circumstance, this is what I care about and I'm going to keep moving towards it. Right. I, I just want to pause there for a little bit and, and, you know, I'm wondering if you could explain to people a little bit about what that moment's like and how you actually work through that urge to just not do it, (laughs) particularly when you, when you could, it would be easy and people would understand when you, when you did not do it. Yeah. And just, you know, um, you and I talked about, you know, you've really helped us understand this notion of above the line, below the line, just for, you know, those who might be listening who don't fully tap into that. I mean, effectively, above the line is kind of yes and behavior, right? It's like, oh, yes, that makes me really uncomfortable. And, you know, I have questions and I'm curious. Below the line is kind of like, no, but. Um, no, but that's not the right way to think about it. No, that's his fault. And it's sort of, it's the defensive behavior, right? So so when you're in a place of, of, of feeling overwhelmed or when the risk is too high or when you're, you know, when those, those, those emotions we were talking about a moment ago I was describing, show up the easiest place to go is into a defensive and, and judging posture right it is to, is to back off but again there's no learning there right it, it's just it's just building walls and so so what what i find is you know being creating a culture and it's not just about me right it's about if i'm the only one doing it doesn't matter it's about creating a culture where we're all kind of interested in getting to the right place, interested in learning, interested in understanding, recognizing those emotions and going, I, yeah, I, I, I feel kind of weird about this. I feel awkward. I don't know what to say. I don't know this sounds weird. And that can be, again, a tech problem I don't get, or it can be, you know, sort of a, a, an equity uh, inclusion and diversity problem, right? It, or challenge. So, so it, it, it ranges the whole, the whole gamut of, of daily interactions. But the thing for me that that's that I've really come to appreciate very deeply, and I, I actually think you know X is a really great place for this, is is this sort of doubling down on psychological safety, right? If I'm going to be vulnerable, if I'm going to lean in and admit I don't understand something, I need people around me to be willing to also move into yes and, mm-hmm. and that means that they come from a place of respect. They can challenge my 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 uncertainty or. or or the, the, the question I, I'm uncertain about, they can challenge the issues, but they can't call me stupid, or they can't put, you know, laugh at you or call you names, right? So creating an environment that's psychologically safe where we can actually look at each other and say, it's kind of like, you know, after, after uh, George Floyd, Stacey, when, when I asked you if you'd, you know, join me in front of our team and have a conversation. You know, I was, pardon my French, but I was scared shitless, right? I had no idea what to say. I had no idea. It was just, I was just really wrought by what had happened and what we'd all witnessed. But, you know, together, you and I sat down and 
because we've been working together, you know, I knew that, you know, we were there to solve this together or to figure out something together, right? Maybe not figure it out, but to understand it better, to, to come from a place of deeper compassion. Obviously, you were you were really suffering under what you had just witnessed and experienced, you know, and and so putting that out there without having it all scripted and knowing what the answers was, to me, that's, you know, that makes the work and the sort of the, the, the opportunity really exciting, right? That makes what we're doing sort of, you know, stimulating because it helps us grow as people. It helps us understand at a much deeper level. And again, it happens, you know, it, it, this applies just as well to a design review as it applies to, you know, a, a, a big moment in, in terms of social justice and social unrest. It's, it's the same principles. And, and so you build a culture to support those principles. And that's really critical uh, and important for me. Yeah. And what you're, I think what you're pointing to is, you know, just to reference that Kneffen model, but mostly the, the idea of complex problem solving, because um, the way that we look at it at the Dignitas Agency, this is, um, if not the most, you know, so it's creating more equitable world is uh, one of, if not the most complex uh, problems that will, that I know that I will live through in my lifetime. And so part of what we try to do is cultivate and build the capacity of that sensing, sensing into the situation and knowing that you don't know what's going to come next. How do you bring everything that you do have and make that available for the conversation, right? And, and not be in the mindset of, I don't know how, so I don't want to try, so I hold back, so then I don't do anything. So even if I do do something, it feels like halfway, like that whole energy. We want to un, you know, have it operating the other direction, which is, I don't know. I'm going to take the first step. I'm going to learn really quickly. I'm going to be responsive to who's there's with me. I'm going to assume good intent. And if something lands wrong, we're going to tell each other about it and we're going to move to the next place. Right. And, and I think this is a capacity that um, if we're, if we really are going to create more in a more equitable world, all of us have to get better at being able to do that. And not just with the people that share the same identities, as us, you know, like to actually be willing to be in that learning with people who sit in different identities, but you're right. It can't be, it can't be, you know, one person in and the other person just kind of sitting on the sideline. You have to, it has to be a hundred percent, a hundred percent or else it falls down because trust falls down. Yeah. And if, if I can maybe, you know, connect a couple of dots around what you're saying right now, because it's so important. Um, you know, people sometimes will ask, well, why is diversity important? Like, you know, I understand why, you know, why it's divert and, and, it's, and why, why, you know, it's, it's important to treat people well, but why is it important for a business, right? It, it, it's a, and it's, a, it's, I think it's a legitimate question, right? It's like, well, so, and I've, I've asked myself that question many times, like, why are we spending so much time on this? And every time I come up with two very simple answers, one is, it's just the right thing to do. You know, the world is, uh, you know, it's, it's my, my, my better half, my partner, Julie, is, um, is an immigrant uh, refugee of war, came to this country as a refugee of war and grew up in, in Alabama, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, we met out here in Silicon Valley. And she's fond of saying, you know, um, that talent is universal, opportunity is not. And so part of why leaning into, um, into diversity is so important is because if we want the most talented people, we got to throw a really big net because there's talent everywhere. And it doesn't come in one particular package or color or anything else or from one particular school. Talent is universal. And, but opportunity is not. So those talented people can't find the path forward. And they might not have gone to the school you want to, but they're out there. And when you unleash them, you know, watch out, right? There's an enormous amount there. So, so not, but the other thing is that you and I have had very different life experiences. When we get together, we look at problems, we look at solutions differently. And that difference, when respectful, when generative, and when above the line, is, is so important, right? And I, I want to tell just a, a short little story about this, which I think is a, is a great little illustration. This happened fairly early on when I, when I started running this project I'm running now, when we started it up. Uh, there was a guy named Vincent, um, and Vincent was a senior engineering director um, who was a part of the project. And he and a bunch of other people were sitting around um, uh, for many meetings discussing whether our robots should have wheels or legs. Mm -hmm. 
and we couldn't decide. It was wheels or legs or wheels. And it, it becomes religious you know, in robotics communities, wheels or legs. Finally, um, Vincent just pipes up and he goes, well, I figure if I can get there, the robots can get there. Everybody turns to Vincent. Vincent is disabled. He's in a wheelchair. And everybody goes, ADA compliant. If the building is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, equipped for, for, for disability, and it's equipped for robots. And we saved a ton of time and discussion and, 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 and around because his lived experience told us if Vincent can get there, the robots can get there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there was this moment where we just were able to, because we had him in the room, because we had Vincent's voice and life experience in the room, we just suddenly unlocked a whole, and we, 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 we tightened that loop, as you like to say, and we, and we just skipped ahead to without having to sort of get through all this analysis paralysis to try to figure it out. And that happens all the time, but it happens so much more when you have people in the room who just come to the problem from a very different perspective and different angle. I, I love so much that you brought that example up um, for, for many reasons. Um, but one of the things that, um, that many of us believe about um, really looking at the world in a more inclusive way is that if you, if you really bring in those voices that, have, that are at the margin, that aren't, haven't been centered, what you're doing is um, not only bringing in the center perspective, because by the way, everybody at the margin knows what the center perspective is and they have to factor it in because they have to live inside of that perspective, but they're also bringing so much more that those um, who are centered don't have visibility to. And with the example that you were just talking about around abilities, um, that's an identity that all of us, if we live long enough, are going to be in. And I heard someone talk on NPR about this. They said, you know, if we're designing our products and services um, for the broadest range of abilities, then everybody benefits from that, everybody on the planet. And um, I just I just think it's an interesting thing, particularly for people who are starting up businesses to be thinking about is like, how do we actually start to center the marginalized identities now so that our product is more universal out of the gate? We don't have to go back and reiterate for certain um, things later on, or we don't have to um, rethink the way we're doing something core or fundamental because we missed it the first time. Um, so yeah, I- and, and, and at the same time, you know, I've been I've been in the startup uh, shoot many times, right? I've started several companies, and I I know how hard it is, right? I know how limited your resources are. I know how short the uh, you know the runway often is, and I was like, well, if I don't make you know when I started out by saying, which was, you know, you lead for surviving to tomorrow and you lead for a story to, you know, you, you tell a narrative and a story for the future. You know, you, you're you very focused on tomorrow if you're in the early stages of a, of a startup. And, you know, it's a luxury to think about the future. But at the same time, if you don't start thinking about the future early, A, you're not learning about what it's going to take you to get there. And, and I'm not saying that diversity is future even, but it's like, if what you want to do is you want to put the most sort of compelling group of voices together that can, that can help you figure out what that future needs to look like. Because even though you might be going really hard just to get to tomorrow and the next deadline, you are going in some direction. And if the real direction is over here, but you missed it because you were so insular and you're heading this way, then it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're still going in the wrong direction. But if on the other hand, you know, you, you, you can pop up a little bit, you can get some help, people pull you out of your bubble and go, you know, look, I, I think, Hans Peter, that the really the opportunity is in that direction and they don't need legs. Wheels are fine. Let's click. Okay, good. Now we can skip that whole thing and just go. So so I, I don't think it's really a question of when or, or whether. It's a question of, like, why not sooner? And, and then, of course, the counter argument becomes, well, it's really hard. It's hard to find people, as you know, and 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 the simple answer there is again is yes, it's hard, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> it's like you know, lean into it, go take the time it takes to find those right people, and sometimes you know you got to kiss a lot of frogs, but but there's lots of people out there with incredible talent, different than yours, that will make you more resilient and stronger. So smiling again, because you're giving me a chance to talk a little bit about one of our framing principles um, at the Dignitas Agency. We, 
we have this phrase of um, there's always going to be circumstances be powerful anyway. And it's kind of trying to recognize that um, if you decide to do something remarkable in the world, of course, it's going to be hard. But sometimes and for whatever reason, we forget that. And when it becomes hard, we're like, well, wait, it shouldn't be hard. Well, no, exactly. It should be hard. That what you'd signed up for was hard. So rather than forget that, how do you stay in it to your point and navigate it? Because you know it, you know what's coming. Like, how do you always remember that I'm here to do something hard and this is just what the territory is? Um, yeah, yeah, that one's, um, it's, it's always fascinating to me how easy it is forget, to forget that, that we're, that we're up to hard things. So um, how about we leave uh, folks with one thing to think about in terms of navigating change, particularly in the equity and inclusion space? Um, how about I go first? I'll go first and then I'll let, then I'll let you, you wrap it up here. But I think there's, you know, for, for any company starting out, I think one thing that I would remind you of is that uh, we at the Dignitas Agency are often working with uh, folks like Hans Peter and, and senior level folks at um, established companies. And what that inflection point around leading versus managing with regard to um, more equitable organizations always is, is, you know, is the business pressure going to be more important than the direction you're trying to go in? And for a lot of people, they think, well, it's going to get easier over time. And I just want to tell you um, that it doesn't. Um, as a startup, it's hard. And when you have uh, shareholders, it's hard. And when you have competition that you have to respond to, it's hard. There's never a moment where you don't have pressure from somewhere. And so um, if you're waiting for that moment when the pressure isn't there to do the thing that you care about, which might in this case might be creating an equitable organization, that moment will never come. So you might as well lean into it now. Um, what would you say? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll go back to um, my ode to discomfort. <laughs> You know, I think for the probably the first two thirds of my life, I ran away from discomfort, right? It, it, it wasn't, or, or I would hide from it or I would, would, you know, try to try to just ignore it. But, you know, I've come to see discomfort as my friend and, and again, you know, some, something to be in dialogue with. And so for me, I think that, um, you know, if I'm going to be the best leader I can be, I, I I have to listen very carefully to these signals, and and I have to be willing to sit with them and sometimes lean into them when you know the discomfort is signaling fear, uncertainty. So in other words, risk, right? Mm -hmm. And and but I you have to be kind of just comfortable with the fact that yeah, there's risk. And that risk can come back and bite you, and kind of might even like knock you off your your, your feet at some at some point if you're if you're you know if, if you're unlucky. But the discomfort is the signal that that tells you often very early on that something's happening. And by leaning into it and get, gaining a deeper understanding, that's when we, I, I think that's when we move forward and accelerate, and oftentimes create you know competitive advantage, right? right? And and so. So my view is that, you know, um, when you're leaning into discomfort, again, you move to compassion. And then suddenly the conversation isn't about risk anymore. It's become, it becomes about justice. It becomes about opportunity. And, and that's where I think, you know, um, great companies are born. And I think that's where, that's where opportunity really comes from, right, is, is when, you, when you're, you're leaning into um, into compassion, understanding, openness, and and as opposed to sort of defensiveness and, and closing down. So I think that's where I want to leave this. And I just want to thank you, uh, Stacy, first off for all the the, the the wonderful coaching and 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 conversations we've had over the last few years, but also for inviting me to participate in this today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I. I my sincere hope is that uh, the folks listening to this conversation and particularly some of the ways that you've been thinking about um, uncertainty in general, but particularly as it relates to creating more inclusive organizations, hopefully they've heard something that will allow them to accelerate the impact that they want to have in, their world, in the world, not only with their product, but in the well-being and um, ability for um, all of us to live 
our most effective and most uh, supported lives. So um, thank you, and I'm sure we will be in touch soon. <laughs> Thank you.